Greetings, salutations, welcome to TFI, where I'm going over my Autodesk University 2018 class again because the the staff at the door who, who ran off to record the class did not record the class. So there's a lot of people asking for it, so I'm going to go over it again. Uh, that's fine. It's called Buying the Right Workstation for Inventor. You'll have seen the title of the video. Uh, that's what it's all about. This was delivered last week at AU Vegas to roughly 60 or 70 people including many of the Autodesk Inventor development team who, prior to delivering the class, in the four months that I was building this class and putting it together, I cross-referenced and checked every, pretty much every fact that I'm about to show you and go through with those guys, and it's all validated. Everything I'm about to show you is, it's a stone fact. There's, it's not up for debate. This is how it is. And a lot of what I'm going to cover are those questions and those misconceptions that people have about Inventor and what they don't necessarily understand about how Inventor works with the workstation. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a strange topic, buying the right workstation, because this could be over in 10 seconds. I could just say, go to the HP store, buy a, a Z2 with a Z on this and a Quadro that and this much RAM, and that's the right workstation. There you go. See you later. And then we could be off on our merry way. But in two months' time, hardware moves so fast. It, in the, the week leading up to this class, Intel were bringing out new CPUs, AMD were bringing out new CPUs and graphics cards. Things change so fast. So what I say is the best workstation right now may not be in two months' time, a year's time. So it helps to understand why something is the right workstation. And that's what this class is mostly going to be all about. However, at the end of it, I will be saying, as of today, this is the best workstation. If you want to buy something now, based off of the stuff you've learned in this class, Today, this one is the right one. There is nothing that will run Inventor better than this. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, we'll cover what's in a workstation, and uh, not necessarily down to, oh, this is the platter on a mechanical hard drive, and oh, this is the NAND flash memory controller inside. No, nothing like that. It's mostly just to make it a bit more friendly, because uh, a lot of people who will be interested in knowing what workstation they should buy just don't understand that sort of stuff. So we'll just make it a bit more friendly, demystify some of the, the things that people don't quite understand, and then just get, get a grasp of what Inventor wants from your workstation. So that's mostly what this is all about. So with that being said, I'm gonna hop on over to the slides. Let's get cracking, mate. Uh, the, this is the exact same set of slides that I used in the class. So it's an Autodesk template. So a lot of the stuff that you think, well, it's a bit weird to be showing that on YouTube. Well, it's, it's kind of like for like really for what was shown at the class. Um, so a bit about me, I've got 20 years experience in uh, Autodesk software, 14 years with Autodesk Inventor uh, from a CAD supplier's point of view, doing the AE thing, the Applications Engineer, training courses, certified training courses, de deployment support, the whole lot. Uh, and then for the last six years, I've been working at a couple of huge Autodesk customers uh, on their side of the fence, making things work from that perspective. So. Uh, and then I've also consulted for Autodesk very briefly. I'm on the Expert Elite roster, certified professional, and do a few YouTube videos now and again. So it's it's pretty much been my entire career from the age of 16 has been working nonstop. Well, that, that would make it, yeah, over 20 years, I suppose, yeah. Uh, that would, uh, yeah, my entire career has been dedicated to Autodesk software. That's uh, that's where I'm at. So let's get cracking with the workstation why care. So Neil, just to find the purpose of the class, permission to waffle. Ah, oh, well, thank you, sir. Right. So there's a couple of things I want to get out of the way before I start the class. And I mentioned this at the time at AU. One of the main reasons why I'm doing this class is because there is so much misinformation that gets spread about through various different channels on the internet, which is usually where people go to look for what workstation they should buy. Uh, I'll not name any names. That will just come back to bite me on the ass. But there's many large gaming-focused tech YouTubers with, say, seven, you know, in the millions of subscribers who put out very, very poor information about what people should buy. And because of the size of their audience and who they are, that is almost like inherited credibility where they have none. For example, in the week leading up to the class, one of these channels put out a video about a, a, a really cheap, or it wasn't cheap, but it was it's a pretty cheap brand, laptop. It was about this thick. It had a desktop Ryzen processor in it with eight cores. And the guy said, this laptop is great for CAD and engineering. And I wanted to reach to the screen, grab him by the neck and throttle his teeth out. It's such bad advice. The, these tech channels, whilst they are very good at what they do, they've got no credibility or credentials 
or any qualifications in CAD and engineering to be able to offer advice to CAD and working professionals in engineering about what hardware they should buy. It's an area they should not go into. What they tend to do is they'll, they'll base their advice off of the fact that they may have a license of that software in-house and one of their trainees might play around with the software, maybe even go on a training course, but then they'll do like an internal project for a couple of weeks and that then you know, run generic benchmark tests on it, canned benchmark tests, by the way, you know, not necessarily real data set tests. And then that's the foundation for their recommendations. But they don't just leave it at that one piece of software. They'll say, that's all of CAD. That's all CAD, all engineering, and it's not right. My recommendations are based off of actual functions within the software. Meshing, uh, shrink wrapping large data sets, placing large drawn views and creating breakout views and section views and level of detail switching and all kinds of things that real people actually do in the software. But my recommendations end at that piece of software. I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't ever say what's good for Inventor is good for Revit. What's good for Revit is good for AutoCAD. What's good for AutoCAD is good for 3D Studio Max. All of these bits of software have different requirements. So when you're putting a workstation together for someone, you have to understand what they're doing and what other things they use and what's most important to them. It's very, very, very poor advice to say to somebody, this laptop is great for all CAD and engineering. Uh, and even yesterday, someone on the Autodesk forums came across a video from the same channel that I'm talking about, where the guy said, this graphics card is great for SolidWorks. And then he then went on to say how it's great for all CAD and engineering. And it, it's not, it's not, it's poor advice. And it, it, it's irritating and infuriating that that advice seeps its way out of their little bubble and into and into our world. So this class is done with the intention of trying to trump that poor advice, bring it from a place of credibility where it's from someone who knows what they're doing with the software, who's worked with it for 20 plus years and is in a position to actually be able to, to test it thoroughly. With that being said, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is considered common knowledge to some people who are interested in this kind of stuff, but it's very easy to forget that what you you think is common knowledge is not common knowledge. I, by the way, I did say I've got permission to waffle. <laughs> you can fast forward if you want to to the next slide if uh, if you're sick of hearing his <laughs> waffle on. But yeah, what you, what you think you know is being common knowledge is not. Uh, if you were to take yourself and drop yourself into any design office and then walk to the nearest draftsman, that person probably hasn't got a clue what Threadripper is. If you say the words Ryzen or L3 cache or anything like that, then they'll go, they'll think you're speaking in a foreign language. It's not necessarily common knowledge at all. Uh, it's not something that everyone knows, which is another thing everyone knows that. It, it not. That's not true. A lot of people who were responsible for buying the workstations and drawn offices and various engineering offices, they're just not into computers. Um, and that's, I guess, the first point on my list is the uh, the slide <laughs> move forward. I just don't understand computers and I don't want to. That's another reason why I'm doing this because I'm not here to get people stoked and all infused and, and, and excited and having a new hobby and me to push on my passion to them like like a, like a young child oh you you will get into what i'm into no it's nothing like that the whole point of this is just to make people understand what it is they should be buying and why i guess this one's just as important this is kind of an elephant in the room with any discussion like this a lot of people who have had a discussion with regarding hardware play down the importance of the hardware in favor of the argument that training and workflow management and staff management is more important to someone being productive what i've tend to have found is those people use that and play down the importance of the workstation because they're not comfortable with having a discussion about computers because they don't understand them so they'll just play it down as being not important enough to be an issue and that's that's objectively not true i'm not disputing at all that user training and someone being intelligent is probably going to contribute more to someone being productive than just having a good computer. I'm not disputing that at all. That's massively important, but that's for a different class completely. Training someone how to use the CAD software and being a good engineer is a completely different field to what I'm talking about. This is just making sure they're using whoever that person is. It could be Einstein or it could be a, a trainee out of school or someone on work experience. I'm just talking about making sure they've got the right computer that that's, that's all I'm talking about. So I'm not disputing that training is a big issue. The analogy that I used was between Michael Schumacher and his car and you and your computer. So statistically and factually, Michael Schumacher, love him or hate him, it doesn't matter, he is the most successful racing driver of all time, a Formula One driver of all time. 
He's won more championships than anyone else, more races than anyone else, and he won the most between 2000 and 2005 in the Ferrari car. At the end of 2005, I think, or was it the end of 2007? I can't remember. The FIA changed some rules, and he, then he didn't win so much because uh, his car wasn't as good. And then he retired, came back two years later driving the Mercedes car, which was an absolute slouch. It was a bag of hammers, and he won... Nothing, absolutely nothing. It was the same guy with the same talent, the same guy that was the best driver of all time, and he won nothing. That was just two years after he'd won seven championships. Same driver, same talent, two years older. That's not really, that's not that big of a deal. But the car was holding him back. And it's kind of the same with your workstation. Giving a good workstation to a bad engineer is not gonna make them a good engineer, but giving a top world-class engineer an absolute shocker of a PC will hold them back it will slow them down and not only that it frustrates them infuriates them and it just dry it grinds morale down to a halt and it can also deter people from trying new things you might have simulation tools on in-house you might have rendering tools in-house you might have all kinds of things in-house cfd and the the engineers might think oh, what's the point in trying my computer's an absolute shocker and that's never a good place to be so the whole point of this is 100 percent just to reduce productivity bottlenecks that's what it's all about it's just to remove the workstation from being a productivity bottleneck that's all that this is about it's making sure that workstation problem is taken care of right then so we're kind of getting into it now so what is a workstation it's a bit of an odd question um if, if i'm in the way I'll, I'll have to turn off the webcam on some of the slides where my face is in the way so for the purposes of this class when I'm talking about a workstation, I'm specifically referring to a pre-built configured box that comes from somewhere like Dell, HP, or Lenovo. And I'll refer to those three as just vendors. It's something you pick from a configurator. It has professional grade parts in it, like Xeons, like ECC RAM, like Quadros or Radeon Pro WX cards. It comes shipped to you in a cardboard box with a polystyrene on. You pull it out the box, you plug it in, and off you go. I'm not referring to home-built computers, DIY builds, overclock builds, GeForce cards, nothing like that. Even though those builds are supported, they run just fine. Personally, I would never put any of those systems into a professional office, and that's just my personal preference. So specifically for the purpose of this class, just referring to the vendor workstations, that is all. Uh, towards the end, I will give a, an honorable mention to a, a good notebook, a good laptop. That might be worth considering if you're into that, if that's what you're looking for. But for, for the most part, we're just talking about those vendor workstations. And that would be something like this. This is the HP Z2 G4 Tower workstation. This is the best workstation that you can possibly buy for Autodesk Inventor today. That one right there that you're looking at is the most powerful workstation for Inventor. Doesn't matter how fat your company checks are, doesn't matter how deep your pockets are, there is nothing in the world that you can buy that will run Inventor faster than that. And that's a bit of a bold statement given that it's less than $2,000. So I wanna say a massive thanks to HP for sending this over. The way this came about is Obviously, knowing that I was doing the class, I put together the spec of this workstation, sent it over to HP and said, look, I'm doing this class. How, how would you feel about sort of maybe loaning me the PC and we'll see how it goes and we'll build the class off this because that is the best one. And they sent it over. So a lot of the, I want to say massive thanks for that. It's been hugely helpful given that. Here's another interesting little story. Kind of, it didn't wind me up. I just found it a little bit amusing when I was at Autodesk University. The sponsors at Autodesk University were HP excluded because they helped me out. We had Dell, we had AMD, we had Nvidia, we had Lenovo, we had MSI, we had uh, well, Box wouldn't help me. <laughs> they they wouldn't they wouldn't do much. Uh, we had pretty much every major system system vendor was at Autodesk University. Not one of them bothered to look at the classes that were on at the event they were at to see. Hmm, I wonder if anyone's doing a class on buying hardware for the applications that are used by this company who we're at. Not a single one of them. They all completely missed the boat. MSI, for example, they could have came to me and said, look, I've noticed you're doing a class on buying hardware for Inventor. I guess people are gonna to listen to you on that, yeah? Well, do you wanna use one of our laptops or one of our notebooks in the class just to show people how it performs and something? It would have been, relatively decent promotion for them but no no not a single one of them <laughs> they didn't they just weren't interested uh when i went up to their booths and mentioned i was doing a class not interested absolutely not interested they just, basically the staff there they would they just turned up just that's another day in their job they were just like nah 
<laughs> Fine, suit yourself. Uh, so that's made me respect HP even more uh, than uh, than I did before. And to be fair, it's no secret on the channel I've always preferred Dell. Dell were the same. They they kind of entertained the idea in the the first few weeks as I was building the class, but then. They went quiet and uh, nothing came of it. So this is the right workstation for Inventor. Uh, what we're going to do now is go through the specs inside it. Uh, well, not the specs, but the, the, the parts inside it so you can get an idea of, of what's inside. That's what I meant when I said at the start about making the workstation a bit more friendly. Because if you're not familiar with computers, if you were to look inside that, you'd think, I've, I've no idea what's in there. I, I don't know what any of this stuff is. I can see wires. I can see fans. I can see a blue circuit, but I don't know what it all is. Well... In essence, if you were to buy your own PC from, say, Newegg or Amazon, all you need is seven items in your shopping basket. That's it. A workstation is made of seven line items. You need a case. Now, the case, fortunately for us, is taken care of by the vendors. You pick the model that you want, and depending on the model that you pick, there's usually three or four different models in a range of workstations. There'll be a small, medium, and a large chassis with different model numbers. And the size of the chassis dictates how many ports are on the front, how many if, if they still do optical drives, usually how many optical drives are in there. Uh, and then also the airflow inside the case, the ports on the back. But it's on the vendor to take care of all that. And that's one of the things that differentiates the vendors from each other is their case design. How connected the cases are in terms of ports. How many fans they put inside the case. How they've designed the airflow, if they've done any designing at all. By the looks of it, HP have. They've got a fan roughly here, which intakes air and then it goes to the CPU and then it's exhausted through the back so it looks like they've given it a bit of thought although the RAM sticks look like they're in the way so who knows I, I don't know actually I think the fan may be down here might be slightly lower but um yeah I've had no cooling issues with this system it's been it's been just fine but that is one of the things that differentiates vendors from the other it's the uh, the case but generally providing that your system's not overheating which with 3d card it really doesn't temperature inside the case tends to not be an issue we're not uh, we're not hardcore overclocking or or gaming on max settings here uh, we've also got the motherboard which is a get what you're given kind of thing all the vendors use proprietary motherboards they all design their own motherboards uh, for each of these cases so they don't use off the shelf say ATX motherboards uh, they're all proprietary so that's another thing that differentiates them all but again you, you just get what you're given but depending on what you buy We've got the CPU, the processor, that's uh, the central processing unit. That's the engine, it's the heart of the system. Uh, we've got the, the RAM, the memory. We've got the graphics card, video card, GPU, and the storage, and finally the power supply. That's all you need to build a system. Those seven labels will build a system. All the wires that you see, all the fans that you see, typically will come with one of or all of those seven line items. Now, as much as I wanted to go over each of these seven line items in great depth, like the difference between SATA and PCI Express and M.2 and all the different form factors and different RAM types and power supply types, I can't do that. <laughs> That's way too much information. So in the description of the video, I've linked my class handout, which swiftly became a report. It's a dissertation. It's 17,000 words long. And uh, that covers every single component at great depth and great length. So by all means, go and download that if you want to look at each of these parts. But for the purposes of the class, uh, I'm covering just the CPU and the graphics card. That's what I'm going to be covering today. Because those are the two parts that most people have most questions about when it comes to building a workstation. So we'll start with... The CPU. So this is the central product. Did you like that slide? That was nice, wasn't it? Oh, I'm off slant. Never mind, never mind. There we am. There's the central processing unit. When it comes to the CPU, there are two major manufacturers in the CPU market for vendor workstations. You've got Intel and AMD, uh, although that previous statement is not entirely true because AMD have absolutely no presence whatsoever in the vendor workstation market. Uh, however, I did mention earlier that things move fast, things change all the time, and uh, even the week leading up to delivering this class, I was hearing talk about AMD potentially getting a Ryzen CPU into an HP workstation. It's one of their Z line, I think it's the 705, uh, might be a sporting Ryzen. Uh, and I asked various various vendors on the, uh, the the expo floor in their booths like Dell like uh, AMD and HP I was like why, why why do you not have many AMD CPUs in uh, in your workstations like uh, Threadripper and that and depending on who you ask you get a different answer from 
boardroom level decisions saying that Intel have to be, you know, the exclusive provider through to there just being no demand really for AMD to make it worthwhile. Uh, all the way through to some, I'm again not naming any names, but some of these salesmen or slash technical experts saying that, you know, th well, Threadripper, we don't put that in our workstations because that's the equipment, you know, that's more of a server CPU, mate, <laughs> mate, no, it's not, never mind, bless, I'll just move on, thanks for your time. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's just a fact. AMD have no presence at all at the moment, so we're not going to talk about AMD CPUs in this class because you can't put them in a vendor workstation right now. But having said that, their consumer slash gaming grade of CPUs are called Ryzen, and uh, if you want to go for a professional slash workstation level CPU, then that's where they're aiming Threadripper at. That tends to be a higher core count CPU. They're not the best for Autodesk and Vendor, which is what I'm specifically explicitly limiting this class to. They might be great for other things, people like to point that out, but I'm not talking about other things, this is a very niche topic. So we'll talk about Intel, because that's pretty much, uh, the, the, they've got the, the market cornered for workstation CPUs, love it or hate it, it's a fact, that's how it is. So Intel have got two brands in their CPU line, they've got the Core and the Xeon brands. Uh, there's a lot of confusion between the two, and there's a lot of overlap now between the two. Historically, there was a big differentiator between the two of them. Uh, not so much anymore. But the core line is designed for and marketed towards home consumer use. Whereas the Xeon line uh, marketed and intended for the professional workstation and also the server market as well. So that's where we're at with, uh, with those two. And we're going to be talking about them in a little bit of depth. Starting with what's the difference it's asked the world over. There's all kinds of videos. Most obviously, the most of them are accurate because it's it's no secret. It's just not common knowledge. Uh, what's the difference between a Xeon and a Core? Uh, the Core being the likes of an i7, an i5, an i3. That's the Core line. The Xeons they've got many different model names and numbers. You tend not to recognise those. Fortunately, I can remember what I thought the difference was before I knew what the difference was. I actually thought the Xeon lines. I'll bring the camera back because uh, there's nothing in the bottom corner. Uh, I actually remember that. I remember thinking that the Xeons, because you only ever saw them in professional workstations, I thought they were sort of infused with some kind of secret code that when it, whenever it detects a CAD application, it would sort of spring into life and work harder on those applications. That was a long time ago, and that was when I really wasn't into this kind of stuff. And that's, uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, as it turns out, the way things are right now, the Xeons and the core CPUs they're actually exactly the same thing. They come off the same production line. They are the same chips, not sort of made in the same factory. No, they are the physical same unit. If you had a Xeon and a core from the same generation at the same clock speed with the same number of cores, they would, in most cases, perform exactly the same. Which, of course, then begs the question, well, well if they're exactly the same, why have they got different names and why are they, why are they different? The Xeon CPUs, they are of a higher quality. They are... They're, they're, tested to be of a higher quality intended for situations where uptime is greater. The Xeon's going to servers, servers are on 24-7. Uh, the same with workstations, they're on a lot of the time, all day, every day with people being at work. Intel know that, therefore their Xeon line are tested to run, not necessarily 24-7 I guess, but maybe. Uh, I don't know too much about their R&D and testing methodology, but they know that that's the, the end result and the end destination for their Xeon CPU. So they're, they're running in enterprise, so they need to be of a higher quality. And also the Xeon chips support additional feature sets that the core line doesn't, that you usually wouldn't need at home. Like ECC RAM, which is error correcting code memory, uh, virtualization technologies and various other things that we just don't care about with Inventor. Because the Xeon chips are supposedly of a higher quality, that tends to be what goes into your vendor workstations but having said that if you wanted to save some money and you were to go for a core cpu from the same generation at the same clock frequency with the same number of cores it would perform exactly the same as the xeon uh, providing that you've got the same cooling solution on it there's there's all kinds of factors i've mentioned all that in the handout that i've linked in the description given that they're exactly the same it's quite easy to see this now if you go over to intel's they've got a website called arc which ark it gives you a rundown of the stats of their cpus so say from the uh, the eighth generation line the 8700k was 
for a long time Intel's flagship i7. It's, it had six cores and 12 threads, uh, 3.7 base frequency with a 4.7 gigahertz turbo frequency, and there was a CPU in the Xeon line with exactly the same stats. It was literally the same processor, but it was just rebranded, repackaged, and relabeled as a Xeon. Uh, the, the TDP, which is the power draw, that's slightly lower on the Xeon, and uh, it also supports ECC memory. That's that extra feature set which has been enabled on the Xeon line, which is disabled on the core line. I have both of those CPUs here in my office, and trust me, they perform exactly the same. Uh, actually, actually, the Xeon is marginally quicker for various reasons, but uh, that's other factors influencing the overall system build. They're exactly the same, the Xeons and cores. So that then begs the question, well, which one should I go for? Well, I personally prefer to put Xeons in a professional office purely because of that reliability uh, that you you might not ever see, you might not ever realize, but if the question's ever asked of you as a consultant, why is my PC broke? Nobody could ever point the finger at you and say, well, you did buy a gaming grade CPU, which you could argue with, but would you want to have that argument? No, so I'll just buy Xeons. Yeah, so yeah, generally identical performance factors affecting this are in the handout and we'll go into what the bottom line is with the CPU, right? So this is what to consider when you're picking a CPU. What are the stats that you'll be given when you're purchasing a workstation, choosing the CPU? CPUs are differentiated by different stats, one being the number of cores. I'll explain more on what those are a little bit later on, but that's a stat that you'll see. It's got two core CPU, four or six or an eight or more. Clock frequency, that's how fast each of the cores are running at. It's how fast each of the CPUs can uh, execute applications and requests. And then also, this is one that usually gets overlooked when it comes to picking a CPU in a professional workstation. It's the generation. It's how new the CPU is. And this, uh, there's something called Moore's Law, which I can't really go into in great depth here, but it's, it's an ideology that every generation, the CPU will gain passive enhancements based on the manufacturing process improving. So we usually find that every generation you get roughly, it, it's sort of diminishing a little bit, but you roughly get a 10% performance gain year on year, uh, or generation on generation. So 4.7 gigahertz today, for example, will not perform exactly the same as 4.7 gigahertz from three years ago, for example. Uh, you'll get the passive improvements from the improvements in the manufacturing process. Uh, but it's a pretty it's a pretty easy thing to take care of. You just just buy the newest one. That's uh, that t that's uh, the easy answer to that, right? So we'll move on to GPUs. There are a lot of similarities between the GPU and the CPU market. In the same way as we've got Intel and AMD in the CPU market, we've got Nvidia and AMD in the GPU market. So unlike their CPUs. AMD actually do have a presence in the workstation market with their GPUs, their graphics cards, and they'll be called the Radeon Pro WX cards. However, having said that, um, uh, as much as I've, I've worked with AMD in the past on the channel, I personally still prefer to buy NVIDIA Quadro cards for workstations for reasons that I'll, uh, I'll again go into in a second, but it's purely because historically AMD have had issues with their drivers. Their driver support, even still today, is not great. They don't come out very often. That might be good for software vendors. They don't have to support as many drivers, but for consumers, it's uh, it's not so great. But their cards have always been slightly behind NVIDIA in terms of performance. That doesn't matter so much with Inventor because it's not GPU accelerated, again, more on that later. But I just personally prefer, whenever I've got a choice, I'd rather just pay that little bit extra and get an NVIDIA card because I've never had an issue with NVIDIA, ever. Not a single issue with any of their cards or any of their drivers, personally. Different people will have different experiences, but it's, it's me doing the class. So that's, that's how it is. They're an option. If you want to save a bit of money and you want to buy a card, there are AMD cards available. They will work, and you'll save a bit of money. So... I'll use them as, a, as, as an option later on. With the NVIDIA line, their consumer-focused cards are called GeForce, and their professional cards are called Quadros. Just like the Xeon and Core CPUs, the GeForce and the Quadro cards are exactly the same chip, but the Quadro cards have additional feature sets enabled, and the Quadro cards are on a standard PCB board with a, a set design build, so the case that surrounds the card, the ports on the front, 
the physical actual card is built by Nvidia and it's a set standard. Whereas the GeForce GeForce cards, Nvidia sells their chips to third parties who then design their own coolers, their own PCB boards, and there's so many different variations of GeForce cards that that's one of the reasons why CAD uh, CAD programs don't don't, don't and they said don't support they do support GeForce cards but they don't advocate them because there's too many of them to possibly test uh, whereas the Quadro cards are a set standard uh, right that's so that's the difference between <laughs> GeForce and Quadro kind of uh, we'll go over the bottom line of the graphics cards right so yeah the areas of interest we've got two vendors we've got N N Nvidia and AMD the model GeForce Quadro the difference between the GeForce and Quadro I've went into great detail in the report that I filed in the description but GeForce typically is for home users and gamers. Quadro is for professional workstation market. However, they are the same chip. For every GeForce card, there is an identical Quadro card. However, having said that, that's also not true. Take the Pascal architecture, for example. There is something called the GeForce 1070. That is exactly the same as the, G as the Quadro P4000. It's the same chip. However, NVIDIA underclock the Quadro chip, so it runs slightly at a lower clock speed than the GeForce variation. And they do that to keep temperatures under control. However, anything that's GPU accelerated, anything that will use the graphics card chip will run slightly marginally slower on the Quadro because it's running at a lesser clock frequency. But everything else in terms of the chip itself is the same. Uh, there are other variations between the GeForce and the Quadro cards. The Quadro card might have more video RAM on the PCB board, different PCB layout, different cooling solution, that kind of thing. So it's, they're not exactly the same. But anything that uses the chip, anything that calls for the resource of the graphics card, it, it for all intents and purposes, they are quite the same. Right, and then we've also got a generation difference as well. Same with the CPUs. GPUs are released in generations, so the current generation of NVIDIA graphics card is called their Turing architecture. That'll be the 20 series GeForce cards and the RTX series Quadro cards. Uh, the RTX 4000, the RTX 5 and 6000. The previous generation to that was called Pascal. That was P, so P4000, Quadro P5000, P6000. The GeForce cards were called the GeForce 1070, 1080, 1080 Ti. So I can't say always buy the newest architecture because it's not always that cut and dry. Uh, the current Nvidia Turing architecture is inordinately expensive. It is horrifically expensive in comparison to Pascal. However, Pascal's reaching end of life they'll stop making them and they'll stop selling them soon so some at some point you'll not have an option you'll only be able to buy the turing architecture but that's the same uh, moore's law the turing architecture will be passively faster than pascal at the same clock speeds it's just how it is it's how it is and then the other differentiator between video cards is video ram this one is very important with 3d card 3d card can be texture rich the textures aren't necessarily very good quality but they can be texture rich so you do need video ram and you can run out of video ram very quickly if you're running on an old graphics card with not so much video ram and i'll show you an example of that a little bit later on okay but isn't this all just about money right we're, <laughs> we're quite far into this we haven't talked about what uh, what workstation you should buy is this just not an issue of just throwing money at a, at a workstation just buy the most expensive of everything and you'll get the best one shouldn't every office just have a supercomputer for large assemblies that anyone that needs to do something super fast can use the supercomputer. Well, we've got ways of testing this. There's a little utility that a lot of people watching this will be familiar with, but not you know, a lot of people won't. It's called Inventor Bench. This is a bit of automation. It's a, it's to a certain extent, a synthetic benchmark test, although it runs natively within the actual Inventor 3D CAD application. This performs a series of six tests. It looks a little like this. And it, I think it's six tests. You've got the warm start, the modeling test, graphics test, hard disk test, and drawing test. And it loads a single part, quite a complex single part. And it performs a series of tests on it. And it times how long your workstation takes to perform those tests, which is a roughly, roughly a good indication of how well your workstation will handle daily real world inventor executions. So the way this works is that you load up the application, you hit go, it then performs a cold reboot of Inventor. So that, I guess, makes sure that there's nothing dodgy about the current Inventor session, it clears it out, loads up a new one, 
and then it starts performing a series of automated tests. At this point, you're just hands off the workstation and you let it do its thing. And it starts with the modeling test. So it'll do a few sketches and it's timing how long it takes to do those sketches. It does a few features, it does a pattern, it does a zoom extents, it does a mirror, and then it does a bigger pattern and it's timing how long it's taken to do these because these are quite computationally expensive. Once it's done them, it records how long it took, logs it, and then it moves on with the next test. The test after the modeling test is the graphics test, and that then shuts this part down and then opens up a new version of it to make sure that nothing went wrong. And that new version is then orbited around and the frames per second of your system is then recorded. How smooth is it to do this? And it does it in various different graphics mode, edges on, edges off, wireframe mode, which is again, more expensive. You can see that's running visually quite slower. And then it records those metrics. You'd think that would be the graphics card at play there. And then it opens up a drawn sheet and it takes that part and then it stamps four views onto the drawn sheet and it times how long it takes the, uh, the, the automation to do those tests. It's either three or four views, uh, three. And then, it, uh, and then it gives you a score at the end of it and it says this is how well your system performs with Autodesk Inventor. So yeah, there's, there's two types of drawn tests. One of them is just, I think it's single view creation and then multi view creation. Uh, that should be a multi-threaded activity. But then, uh, then it ends it and there's the test there. So each of those boxes is a timed result for how long it took the test. And then this one here is the IPI. That's just an overall big number to say, this is your score. Compare this with other people. This is how well your PC coped with Autodesk Inventor. So we can use this tool to test expensive high-end workstations. Now, talking about those laptops recommended by the general gaming press, uh, those things could be tested pretty easily as well. And uh, I, uh, I, I've got a bit of a tragic story here. This thing here, this has got nothing to do with the gaming press, but it's it's kind of similar. It's of a similar ilk. This is a seven and a half grand Lenovo P720 workstation. This tragically turned up at one of the sites that I manage. I didn't know anything about it. The user who it was intended for rang me up one day and said, my new workstation's here, can you install CAD on it? And I was like, what new workstation? So I remotely connected into it, looked at the control panel and I was like, mate, you are in for a hard time with this workstation. This is possibly gonna be worse than what you had before. Having said that, it had two Xeon silver, pro these are brand new silver processors in current generation, 20 cores total, 40 threads, 32 gig of RAM with a Quadro P4000. It costs seven and a half thousand dollars. Quite a good spec, you would think. The, the, the general gaming tech press would say that that's great for CAD and engineering with all those threads and that big Quadro. Well, this pulled a 7.37 on the test. And if you don't know what the test means, probably have no perspective on what a seven is. Is it out of 10? No, it's not out of 10. It goes higher than a 10, but still no perspective on what a seven is. So with that being said, quite some time ago, and I did a YouTube video on this, I built this little geezer here. This is a little home built DIY PC. It looked exactly like that in that case, and it cost $550. It was entirely $550. The sum of everything from the case through to the power supply came to $550. And I built this with one goal in mind, to prove what Inventor needs from a workstation, exactly which parts matter. And I built it with the intention of it being more effective at running 3D CAD than most of the workstations that unsuspecting buyers are putting into engineering offices. This had a two core Pentium processor, eight gig of RAM and Radeon R9 graphics card, which I think was a R9 280 or something like that. It was, it was a pretty poor graphics card. Uh, and the eight gig of RAM could have easily been at the time upgraded to 16 gig of RAM for an extra $100, possibly even less at the time because RAM was quite cheap. So bearing in mind that the Lenovo pulled a 7.37 and cost $7,500, what would you expect the $550 PC to pull on the test, given that it's 14 times cheaper? Would you expect it to be twice as slow? Should the Lenovo be twice as fast? Should it be just marginally slower? I mean, what kind of what kind of score we're looking at here? It pulled a 9.13 on the test. Now, if you still don't understand the test, you probably still have no 
perspective as to what I mean is that a fraction of a second faster in each test I mean come on Neil is this marginal you know did it did it finish the drawn views in, in a, just half a second faster the modeling was that you know we're talking like a third of a second faster to do the modeling here is that the difference between a seven and a nine not quite no the Lenovo took 13 seconds to complete the modeling test and my cheap PC did that in half the time. It was twice as fast in the modeling test. And you can't quite see it on the uh, on the screen because the numbers are quite small, but it was nearly twice as fast at the graphics test. That's that's quite telling. Uh, and the only reason I did this was to prove that a lot of vendor workstations that are put into offices are incorrectly specced. I am in no way saying that anyone should be buying this. <laughs> this is a terrible PC to put in an office. It's only got two cores. It'll be terrible at multitasking. It's only got 8 gig of RAM, it'll be terrible at large assemblies, although that could be upgraded. The Radeon graphics card only had 2 gig of video RAM. It was okay, probably for a student or a, maybe a home user, but I would never put that in an office. I just did this purely to emphasize that it's very easy to spend a lot of money on a workstation and buy the wrong one if you don't know what you're buying, to the tune of being twice as slow as somebody else. So... With that being said, what do you need to look for in a workstation? Out of everything I've just been talking about, which of those parts has got the most influence over Inventor and what makes it tick? Well, by an absolute country mile, it's the CPU. The CPU dictates absolutely everything that happens inside Autodesk Inventor. And it also bottlenecks everything inside Autodesk Inventor. That includes things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, such as opening and saving files. If you're opening a large data set or saving a large data set, it's easy to assume that it's the hard disk or the solid state drive that controls how fast things open and how fast things close. That's absolutely not correct. It does help. And having a mechanical boot drive, for example, will considerably bottleneck your overall system performance. But consider that most modern solid state drives can read and write at anything up to four gigabytes per second. It's not really as simple as that. That handles files in different ways. But if you had, say, a gigabyte data set and you were to save that fresh, it's never been saved before, it's going to take a lot longer than a second to save that data set. But how can that be? Because the hard disk read and writes at four gigabytes per second. Well, it's because the CPU is responsible for saving the files, putting the data into the files, compiling all the what, whatever routines it needs to do to structure the files, opening files. When you open a large data set, the software has to recompile everything, look at the constraints, check there's no pending updates. It's all CPU activity. The hard disk, the actual read and write of the files is a very, very, very small part of what goes on when you open and save files. The CPU dictates simulation. It dictates creating drawing views. Even your graphics performance is 100% dictated by the CPU. And at this point in the class when I was doing it, there was a few eyebrows being raised. And, no, it's, come on, it's a graphics card, Neil. Everyone knows that. It's a graphics card. Well, just bear with me for a second because I've got a friend about to join me. And that's uh, Arnold's... Uh, I don't know why I put this in. It just seemed like I wanted someone shouting at me like an angry internet troll. Isn't Inventor a single-threaded application? You hear this all the time. What I've found, a lot of people who say this usually don't really know what that means or why it matters. They, they probably know what it means, but they don't know what it means in the software. What does that translate into? They know it's there, but they still think that just having a really powerful CPU will just overcome it all. It's just going to overpower any of those single-threaded arguments. It's 2018 after all, and surely a big, powerful CPU will make all the make all the difference. Well, I'll just quickly give you an explanation of what single and multi-threading is, just before I actually go over this. So, this is a CPU. That's what it looks like, right? That's your central processing unit. If you were to take this off, right? This is the the integrated heat spreader. That's where your thermal paste goes on. Underneath that is this it's the die thank you gamers nexus for appearing in google images credit tech jesus for the image that's the cpu die if you were to take off that little metal lid which you never should you'll see this right obviously that doesn't, doesn't mean much so we'll separate that into segments and then get rid of the stuff that we're not really interested in for the purposes of the class that leaves us with the cores i kind of have to ignore the presence of hyper threading at this point because not only does it not really help us much inside a single threaded application but it really doesn't give you much more power anyway it, it's a it's a common misconception 
if you're hyper-threaded, you've got twice as much power. It's absolutely not true. The way hyper-threading works is that it takes each core and it splits it into two virtual cores. And an application can be assigned to either that virtual core or that virtual core and then run in parallel. The contrary is that an application is assigned to the core and any other application has to wait for that application to finish doing what it's doing before the core can get to it. That's what hyperthreading helps with. So there is a marginal power boost, but it's certainly not a linear straight up two times power boost. This is how a single threaded application works in, in very, very, very basic terms. So say you get into work in the morning, you boot up your computer, you fire up Inventor, it'll assign itself to say this core. And for as long as you're using Inventor, it'll just run on that core, happy as Larry. You open up Google Chrome, for example, it may assign itself to that core. And they can both do their thing without bugging each other. You've got a six core CPU after all, so they're not gonna interfere. But that's not necessarily how things work. If you open up Task Manager and look at your process list, you'll find you've got tons of things running in the background, little Windows services and whatnot, and Windows search and Windows update and host services and all kinds of different things. And they're also assigned to cores, but fortunately most of them don't run at 100% unless something's gone tragically wrong. In fact, they tend to run between zero and 1% for the most part. A couple of them might spike up now, now and again, but say the core that inventor's running on, for as long as these three processes which are using that core are running at say 1% and 0.1%, inventor has most of that core to itself if it ever needs to use 100% of it. That's usually how a single, app single threaded application works and that's, for the most part, how Inventor works. Nearly everything you do in Inventor works like that. You have these other five cores sitting around idle, doing not much, whilst Inventor is only using this one core for the majority of its use. A multi-threaded application, for example, like says 3D Studio Max, if you boot that up and then start a render, for example, Max will take its process and attach it to all the cores in the CPU and then use 100% of all of those cores, providing that 100% of all those cores is available, and it'll assign all of those cores to finish a render job, for example. So I've got a bit of an anecdote here to just to just kind of drive this home. When I was in the office, before it was, this was actually two weeks before I went to AU, so I've, I added this in last minute. There was a draftsman that came to me in the office, uh, and he, he said exactly what I mentioned before about the supercomputer. He was like, Neil, we've got this big assembly. It's a huge vehicle, and it's absolutely massive. It's taken like 10 minutes to open up. Once it's open, it's running really, really, really slow. Is it worth us getting a supercomputer so that we can jump on this supercomputer whenever you know we need to work on this large assembly or something with two processors in and loads of graphics cards i was like god oh, bless oh bless it really really wouldn't it wouldn't help so what i did i want to turn the webcam back on for a second just uh so you can you've got something else to look at except arnie so what i did was i asked him what the part number was of that vehicle i went and opened it up on my workstation which is at the time, when we bought them, was the best workstation you could buy at the time. And I observed the CPU activity whilst I was waiting seven minutes for the assembly to open. My workstation is a six core Xeon workstation with 12 threads. So when you look at Task Manager, you'll see 12 boxes with 12 threads, but there's only six cores. And it looked like this. This is midway through opening up a large assembly. It looked a little something like this. This here is one thread because it's at 100 percent that's pretty much the entirety of one core being plowed into that thread and i've got six other cores doing absolutely nothing yet i'm waiting six or seven minutes for this assembly to open that raises a few questions doesn't it why are people waiting and wasting minutes in their working day for things to finish when they've actually got and bought the equipment that could accelerate that and make it faster fact is just how it is. Invent is a single threaded application. That is what a single threaded application looks like, and that's what you suffer with. This has all been verified and referenced with the Inventor development team. They they're aware that this is it's a, it's an issue. It's not as easy as you might think to fix it though. And that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been addressed yet. But for now, we have to just deal with this. If you were to go and buy that supercomputer, that supercomputer might have been, I don't know, a, a 32 core Xeon thinking this is an absolute powerhouse smash of a workstation. It's going to open up the assembly at absolute lightning fast time. It would have actually opened it up slower because when a process is limited to one core, that process is 100% reliant on how fast that core is running. And it's just the way things are right now, the more cores you have on a CPU, the slower those cores are. So if that 32 core Xeon is running at say 2.5 gigahertz, this core here 
is running at 3.9 gigahertz, it'll open up slower on the supercomputer. That's how it is. So that's what your single threaded application looks like. I'm not showing this to beat on Inventor, by the way. This is just to show somebody out there that upgrading your computer might not necessarily fix performance issues that you've got. And it's also not to beat on the Inventor team because I am more than aware after speaking with them at great length that converting a lot of these processes over to multi-threaded processes isn't necessarily as easy as you might think. But it's something that I still advocate that they really, really need to start working on, doesn't matter how hard it is. This is it again. This is the same assembly. You can see it kind of partially there in the background. It eventually opened up. And then I switched levels of detail from the master over to a sub level of detail. It took five minutes to switch levels of detail. One core was being used, the rest of them sitting there idle, doing nothing. They're like, mate, we're here if you need us. We can finish this in <laughs> like five times faster if you just used us, but it can't. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be a linear five times speed improvement. I'm just using that as an example. But that's not necessarily the full story because you'll also hear this when you go out and about and ask questions. Inventor can use multiple cores. For example, drawn views. Now, Inventor using multiple cores is very similar to 3D Studio Max. It can spread itself out over all the cores, assign itself, and then use 100% of all of those cores. And that's detailed on the Autodesk website on this page. If you Google search support for multi-core processors in Vendor, you'll come across this page and it'll say Inventor supports multi-core operations in these workflows, drawn views, graphics, import workflows, modeling command, simplification, task scheduler. I have somewhat of an issue with a lot of these solutions in that a lot of them don't really get used all that often. For example, task scheduler, that's not making Inventor multi-core, that's an external tool that fires up lots of single threaded processes at once, like scheduling jobs, like checking in drawings, and it doesn't make the check-in multi-threaded, just the task scheduler itself is multi-threaded. Uh, the same with import workflows, like AnyCAD, for example. Great that it is, it's just not something that gets used all that often. So the most common used workflow on this list would be the drawn views. So let's look at this. In the next slide after this one, I'm gonna place four drawn views onto a sheet. It's a real world customer data set. It's a large assembly. It's not a little suspension fork or a or a daft air blower or a fan unit that you get from the, uh, the sample files. This is a real world customer data set. Thousands and thousands of parts. And I'm placing four drawn views on a sheet. I'm gonna open a task scheduler. No, actually no, it was at the end. I opened a task scheduler right at the end when the drawing views finished being created. And I'll show you the processor activity. Bear in mind that Inventor supports multi-core workflows in drawn views. This is what it looked like over the course of placing the four drawn views. Now it's not terrible. It did use multiple cores. It did use all six cores whilst the drawn views were being created. But look at all the white empty space. White empty space in that graph means core and workstation doing nothing. And there was a lot of nothing happening whilst I was waiting for my drawn views to be created. These grids here, these are 10 second increments. The drawing view took 70 seconds to finish. So this is a 60 second timeline. For the first 10 seconds, which would have been around about here, I think this was the only thread that was actually being used. So the first 10 seconds was single threaded, 100%, which is good. So it was, it, it's optimized quite well. But then after roughly 15 seconds, we saw a spike, it didn't quite go up to 100%, but it sort of petered around there. Uh, it dipped here, and it was the same across most of the cores. And for 25 seconds, we got all of our cores being used. For 25 seconds out of 70 seconds. You do the math on what percentage that is. And then for the last 30 seconds, this is when the drawing view finished. That's when the little green chevrons disappeared from around the views. For the last 30 seconds, absolutely nothing happened except a little bit of activity on this one core. I'm struggling, if I'm honest, to call this a multi-threaded operation, given that oh, it was only 25 seconds out of 70. But it is what it is. It is what it is. I spoke to one of the developers afterwards. He called me up and he, he, he collared me on this slide and he was like, you know, it's not as easy as blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I was like, oh, fair, look, fair enough. I'm just showing you what I'm just showing you what it actually what actually happens. So you could make the argument that throwing more cores at this might not help the drawing view go faster. 
Would accelerating 25 seconds out of 70 make the drawing view finish quicker? Would that be worth the time? I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. Uh, well, actually, it's not hard to tell. I, I have benchmark tested drawn views across multiple workstations with more cores, and it, it tends to not scale at all with the uh, with the number of cores. It's always been the faster the cores are, the faster the drawn views finish. Eight cores running slower will finish drawn views in, in more time than, say, six cores running at a higher clock frequency, or even four cores running at a higher clock frequency. That's what I found across a lot of the tests that I've run. So that's drawings, but what about all the other modules? What about everything else? What about you know, some picking on drawn views? I mean, that is the most common thing that people will do out of all of this, and it's probably the most heavy workload. But what about the other ones? Well, let's take a look at generating mesh. Finite element analysis, famously one of the, I think it was one of the first areas of Inventor to get multi-threaded support when I think Autodesk acquired a simulation technology. I'll take the camera off again because I'm getting in the way of the test. This is a series of four workstations that have been benchmark tested on the same workflow. It's that part up at the top right corner. It's a little alloy wheel. I did the modeling, so I know it's good. The simulation meshing was done at the same properties across all four tests. And the quickest PC to finish the test was the HP workstation. Yeah, that's the, the right workstation from Vendor. There's uh, nothing that I've tested this. I've run it on more than four systems. I've run it on roughly 30. And the HP was the fastest. Look at an example, the Ryzen 7 system with eight cores here it finished in 242 seconds as opposed to the 197 of the HP. A 197 seconds, that's still quite a long time to wait for something to finish. Would you not agree? That's three minutes of your inventor session being locked out and you sitting looking at a green bar waiting for it to finish. You can't do anything else whilst it's doing it. So what I did is opened up Task Manager whilst it was performing the meshing. And this was my processor activity during the first 60 seconds of the HP test. There's not a lot going on there. That's the first 60 seconds you can see computing mesh. And I'm seeing no processor activity. A little spike here, a little spike there. Bear in mind these are 10 second increments. That's probably one second of it spiking to probably 70% and then going down. One or two seconds up to 100% and going down. This is about... 10 seconds worth of activity on one core. Just absolutely nothing happening, really. In the grand scheme of things, nothing going on. But what about the second 60 seconds? Shoot, right, it took three minutes. That's the first third. Maybe the second third, it just went all hell to leather. Maybe that's when it started. To, it just jumped in, actually fired up, and it started doing the meshing. No, no. That's the, that's the second 60 seconds of the three minutes of meshing. So again, I'm not doing this to, to beat on Autodesk. There's clearly optimizations that they need to do here, but it's just to show you that when you're waiting a while for something to finish, upgrading your workstation may not necessarily make a difference. It's probably the software that's causing the bottleneck in some instances. All right, well, that's the second 60 seconds. Obviously the last 60 seconds, it just went balls to the wall and finished the meshing. Uh, that's probably where this processor went. Well, nothing <laughs> happened in the last 60 seconds at all. Three minutes to mesh that file. You would, It would be reasonable to assume, if you didn't look at the task manager, that you would think a complex part like that, your processor was being smashed over the duration of that three minutes, when in fact it was idling, doing nothing. And clearly there's no other processors going on there. There's nothing else stealing resource. This HP box is actually very well optimized. It, when Inventor's not open, the CPU flatlines at zero. There is nothing happening in the background. And that was all Inventor. Every little every little peak and trough down here, this is all Inventor just tickling the processor to get that meshing done. And that's, uh, that's one of our multi-threaded workflows in Autodesk Inventor. Just another example of why potentially going for a high-end multi-core thread ripping Xeon of a CPU might not always be the best option for Autodesk Inventor. All right, also fair enough, Neil, but you were joking earlier on about how the CPU dictates the graphics performance, and oh, it's, it's, come on, Neil, turn it in. It's a graphics card. That's why Autodesk say you should get a Quadro. That's why all the NVIDIA marketing about Quadros being excellent for 3D card is it's all graphics. It's, it's the graphics card. It's graphics, Neil. It's 3D card. Surely it's the graphics card that does it. Let's take a look at that, shall we? This here is uh, 
an arrow pointing at the MSI Afterburner plugin. Notice the 14 FPS that you're looking at right there. I'm gonna hit pause here, just so we can uh, discuss what we're looking at. 14 FPS as the model is spinning. FPS is a metric that we use to measure graphics performance. It's typically used in games. When a game is running, we, we want the game to be as smooth as possible. A jerky, laggy game is very difficult, if not impossible, to play. And the smoothness is based on how many frames every second is being delivered to your monitor by the graphics card. You could argue a video is a series of still images just joined together over time. And how the more still images you have, the smoother that video will be. So in our case here, we are getting 14 images thrown to our monitor every second by the graphics card which results in it looking a little something like that. So it's fine, actually. I'm not too concerned about that. The ideal place to be is around 60 for most people in the professional market. Most professional monitors that you'll get shipped with HPs and Dells, they run at 60 hertz, which means your monitor displays a picture 60 times every second. So in order to be perfectly smooth, you need 60 frames to be delivered to your screen every second. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. The fact that we're getting 14, it's usable, but it suggests something's struggling, something's being bottlenecked. Is it an issue? Probably not. But the bigger the data set that you work on, the slower that's going to be to the point where you think, mate, you, you go to your boss, you go, mate, I'm working on this little vehicle here. I'm getting 14 frames per second faster. When, when I put that on a ship deck, and I put the A-frame on the back and the winch. I'm going to struggle here, mate. I'm really going to struggle. I need a better graphics card. And this was done on the Quadro P2000 in the HP workstation. Now, the Quadro P2000 is an, it's an entry-level Quadro card. It's about $400. It's it's good enough for kind of entry-level 3D card. But NVIDIA would, would tell you, if you're doing large assemblies, you should go for a P4000 or a P5000. It's the mid and then the high-end Quadro card. I upgrade the graphics card. I put in a Quadro P5000, and then I do exactly the same test on exactly the same PC with exactly the same model, only with a Quadro P5000 installed. That is indeed a major upgrade. It's not just a major upgrade, it's roughly three times more powerful across all metrics. It's got 2,560 CUDA cores, three times more teraflops. It's got much more video RAM in it, runs at a higher clock. It's everything is better on the P5000. It is objectively a far more powerful graphics card and a far more expensive graphics card. The P5000 is $2,000. P2000 is $400. If I convinced my boss to upgrade me to one of those, I would expect, I don't know, it's three times more powerful, a lot more expensive, maybe, come on, it's, it's got to be at least twice as fast. At least twice as fast. I would expect at least 30 frames per second. Yeah, that's reasonable if you're going up to a P5000. Well, let's do that same test on the same model in the same PC with the P5000. Remember, the P2000 pulled 14 frames per second. This test here is with the P5000. Observe the frame rate in the top left corner. We are also getting 14 frames per second with the Quadro P5000. There is not so much as a single frame per second increase when going from a $400 graphics card up to $2,000. For the purposes of anybody watching this from the Inventor Forums, can we please, please stop recommending people buy stupidly expensive graphics cards and suggesting that a graphics card upgrade will improve their frames per second? Can we please for the love of all that's holy, use this as the reference to prove that upgrading your graphics card will not increase your graphics performance. I'm sick to the back teeth of typing it into the forums and it just gets lost and buried underneath more posts and more posts and reference this wherever you need to and show people going up from an entry level graphics card up to something expensive will not give you so much as a single frames per second increase. But fair enough, okay, but what, what about when you start using shadows and visual styles? Maybe that's a one-off. Maybe bottleneck somewhere else. I don't know. What about shadows and reflections and all that kind of stuff? Maybe the P5000 will help us out when we start taxing it a bit more. All right, fair enough. So I did a test with shadows on, realistic mode enabled, 
with an IBL on, with grid light, and uh, let's see what happens. What you'll find, if uh, the video does, there uh, we go, start and play now. On the left is the P2000, on the right is the P5000. Once they'd both settled down, we are getting eight frames per second in both of them consistently. Eight frames per second on the Quadro P5000, and eight frames per second on the Quadro P2000. Same data set, same PC, same model, same test, same everything. Can we please draw a line under this once and for all? The graphics card does not cause any, not a single ounce of performance increase in Autodesk Inventor. Just to, just to, just to drive this home even more. Uh, and not just that, this is a little bit concerning, but it's just how it is. I'm not going to be on Autodesk for this. They've done these things for a reason. But let's just consider the P5000 during this test. It was running at eight frames per second. That's very poor. That's the point. If I hadn't have turned the setting off, that's the point where Inventor would start dropping and making objects disappear so that there's less load on the system and it would speed up. You've all seen it when you orbit an assembly and parts start vanishing off screen whilst you're zooming and panning. To be at eight frames per second suggests that something is struggling. But if we look at the graphics card, whilst the test was being performed, that's this one here, GPU load, whilst Inventor was struggling and tanking at eight frames per second, GPU load was at 11%. There's 89% of the P5000 available to be used throughout the duration of the test. I think the start of the test around here spiked a little bit there, but for the most part, it's running at 11%. Not just that, look at the GPU core clock. This is like your engine's rev limiter. The core clock goes up to, this is the P5000 under a heavy stressful GPU synthetic test. It's at 100%. GPU core clock goes up to 1733 megahertz. Whilst Inventor was tanking at eight frames per second, the core clock was, wasn't even breaking a sweat. It's at 1113 megahertz. It's practically idling. We have all of this $2,000 graphics card sitting doing nothing whilst Inventor is tanking at eight frames per second. Once again, can we please draw a line under any con any question of the graphics card being a thing in Autodesk Inventor? I think this also applies to Fusion 360, but beyond Autodesk 3D CAD or mechanical applications, this does not apply to anything else. It doesn't apply to SolidWorks, doesn't apply to Pro Engineer, Katia, nothing else. This is not CAD or engineering generalized. So what about the CPU then? If this, how, just how much and how can the CPU control the graphics? Well, I can test that as well. This test here is my BMW alloy wheel. I took uh, another home built system. It was a 2500K i5 with a GeForce 1070 graphics card, m orbited the model around, and I recorded 71 frames per second with the CPU at 3.4 gigahertz. What I then did was I re repeated the test with the CPU at a higher clock frequency. I increased the clock frequency from 3.4 gigahertz to four gigahertz. That's a 19% clock frequency increase. Don't take a guess how much the frames per second increased by when I ran the test again. There was a 19% increase in clock frequency. Frame rate increased by exactly 19% to 84 frames per second. Same graphics card, same test. Same PC, same assembly, same parts, same everything. Just an increase in clock speed by 19% and my frame rate increased in an absolute bang on linear fashion by 19%. Oh, but I didn't stop there. I increased the frequency again by 14% from four gigahertz to 4.6. I had an absolute winner of an over overclock in i5 here. And the frame rate increased by 13%. That's telling to say the least. And then finally, I increased the clock frequency by a further 12% to 5.1 gigahertz, and the frame rate increased yet again up to 101 frames per second. So using the same graphics card, just increasing the clock frequency boosted Inventor's graphics performance from 71 frames per second up to 101. Now bear in mind, 71 frames per second is not terrible. That's completely doable. But if I was using an assembly, big data set, were struggling at eight frames per second, this increase in clock frequency would have pushed up the graphics performance in a way that the graphics card absolutely did not. So after all that, uh, I needed to make a note to myself to, uh, to, to to actually make a make a point of saying why the graphics card actually really does matter. It doesn't give you any 
acceleration, but there is one thing about the graphics card that really, really, really matters, and it's the video RAM. The video RAM is something that I have never once heard anybody talk about in any of the drawing offices that I work in, but it's something that can easily jump up and bite you on the ass. In the background behind MSI Afterburner, which is a benchmarking tool you can use to look at the statistics of your graphics card, I've got a huge invented data set open. I opened up a couple of other applications in the background, Fusion 360, Outlook, a few PDFs, a couple of Google Chrome browsers, and my video RAM usage jumped up to 10.5 gigabytes of video RAM. Bear in mind that most entry-level to mid-level quadros max out at eight gig of video RAM. And there's a lot of people out there who are still using very, very old quadro cards with one gigabyte of video RAM in. What happens when Inventor runs out of video RAM is it starts paging the textures that it, used, that it needs to store on the video RAM, it starts paging them off into system memory and into virtual memory. And that increases just unreliability and stability. That will get a performance hit. So video RAM is something that absolutely needs to be considered. There's not really a general rule of thumb, but a couple of rules are if you use more than one monitor, you're increasing your video RAM usage. If you're using a higher than 1080p, you're increasing your video RAM usage. 4K monitors use uh, more high resolution textures, which increases how much data stored in video RAM. But what we tend to go with is over 100,000 parts, you're gonna need over eight gig of video RAM. Under 100,000 parts in your assemblies, you can probably get away with eight gig of video RAM. You shouldn't ever, ever in 3D CAD in 2018 have a video card with less than four gig of video RAM. There's a good chance at some point, if you do have only four gigabytes of video RAM, you'd have probably run out of video RAM at some point, maybe just not noticed it. You might have had a bad time at the time, but you wouldn't have known why. It's not a statistic that's shown to you when it happens. That's why I usually go for Quadro P4000 or the M4000, or this generation will be the RTX 4000, when I'm specking uh, workstations for a client. That usually has a moderate to good amount of video RAM in there without it being an overly too expensive graphics card. Okay, so after looking at the, the video RAM and how the CPU is ultimately responsible for graphics performance, providing that you, you're not hitting any VRAM bottlenecks, if the CPU is king, then how do you choose the best one? Like, How do you know which one you should go for? Well, it's pretty simple, to be fair. There's one stat and one stat only that you need to look for and that's the clock speed when you're picking a cpu for a workstation always go for the cpu that has the highest frequency and it's easy to find uh, this is a picture of a configurator there's a number of options and these two numbers here are the clock frequency that's the base clock frequency that's what the cpu will run at for the majority of the time and then this one here is how fast the cpu will turbo when it's under load it's usually on a single core though what you have to be a little bit careful of is the default CPU. Now this is something that I criticize vendor workstations for at the time in the class, and that is defaulting their configurators to the worst components when you launch the configurator. They do that so they can give you the lowest possible starting price to kind of reel you into the configurator. And that usually includes very low amounts of system RAM, a terrible mechanical hard drive, and a terrible processor. And I've seen people buy computers based off of the default configuration, thinking that, well, all the market material about the workstation being the fastest possible, and it's the super accelerated workflow machine, that will also apply to the default configurator. I only need, a, I don't need the base one. I don't need anything super expensive. No. If you were to accept this default processor, it's got four cores at 2.9 gigahertz. In 2018, that is absolutely dreadful. That's not good enough and you will be twice as slow as everybody else at operations that you sit and wait for. It will be just passively twice as slow. It's not gonna make you twice as slow, but it will. when you're waiting for things to happen, this one will be twice as slow. So based off that list, looking at the number of cores, looking at the frequency, this one here would be the best option. It's the W2125. It's the CPU running at the highest base frequency, and it's also got the highest turbo frequency. Uh, you could possibly go for something with a few more cores. It depends on what else you do. I said at the beginning that I can't really factor in other things that people do, but you know what you do. If you do renders, if you're the guy that creates the sales renders as well as you're an inventor engineer, well then you might have to think, ah, you know, I will have to wait and we'll sit and wait for renders to finish. Well, in that case, renders do use all the cores and 
all the threads on your system. So you could maybe put in a workstation that's got a couple more cores in there and don't sacrifice on the frequency too much. So when Inventor is boosting on a single thread, it can go up to 4.5, but you've then got six cores for those, for those rendering workloads. Or this one here, but the price goes up. So it's always a compromise. It's always, okay, I'm gonna pay a little bit more, but I'll get that little bit more. With the 2145, you'll get eight cores, you'll get 4.5 turbo frequency, but we're down with 3.7 gigahertz base frequency as opposed to the four gigahertz on the 2125 at four cores. So it's a bit of a compromise to, let, to play off there, but generally, if you are just using Inventor, you wanna go for the one with the highest base and turbo frequency with an eye on the architecture. If you're not sure what the architecture is, if you don't know whether the 2125W is new, you can just go over to the Intel Arc site punch it in and it'll tell you here it was launched in Q3 2017, which is fairly new. And you can then browse around the website and look to see if anything else is newer. If there is something newer, doesn't necessarily mean that Dell, HP, Lenovo are even offering them yet. Okay, so um, we're nearly at the end. Uh, I'm giving a, an honorable mention to a couple of things to watch out for. Now I'll put VRAM here at the, uh, at, the, at the start of the steps, but then I decided to put it in there after I saw my 2080 Ti get maxed out on the video RAM and I thought, no, that's probably worth a mention. But uh, yeah, four gigabytes plus is advisable, as said before. Ideally, if you are a, a production user, you wanna be putting in eight gig of video RAM because you'll end up with two monitors, potentially three monitors, and you'll end up loading up Inventor, you'll have AutoCAD in the background, you might have 12 tabs open, you'll have Chrome open. It adds up. It really does add up over time. And it's it's crazy to think how fast it can it can max out four gig of video RAM very easily. Uh, system memory. Funnily enough, you'd think that would be quite a big part of this class. Buying the right workstation, surely RAM is something that's really important and should be given quite a lot of time, but I haven't mentioned it at all really so far because it's just, Pretty simple answer, you put in as much as you possibly can. Autodesk Inventor is not sensitive to dual channel, the quad channel, it's not sensitive to RAM frequency, you just put in as much as you can. If you're going for a Xeon CPU, just get ECC RAM, pick the option and put in as much as you can afford. 16 gig is the absolute minimum you wanna be at. It'll be very easy to max out 16 gig of RAM these days. Usually I'd put in 32 gig, if you can go up to 64, do it. It's not gonna cause you any harm, and it saves you having to think about an upgrade later on. If you look around on minimum system requirement pages, you'll see recommendations for, if you're working on this size of assembly, get this much RAM. Those are okay to a certain extent, but they're not always true. A lot of real-world data sets have got massive derived parts inside them, uh, shrink-wrapped assemblies, and things that just one file can increase the RAM usage absolutely massively. This is another reason why these tech YouTubers shouldn't really be putting out recommendations because they don't understand that. So yeah, they're, they're okay guidelines to go off, but I would go for a minimum in production of 32 gig, but put 64 if you can. For storage, I would say uh, never under any circumstances entertain a mechanical hard disk as the boot drive. That's kind of obvious at this point, I would hope. Uh, and I also called out the vendors in the class and said, under no circumstances should you guys be defaulting the mechanical hard disk as the boot drive in a vendor workstation because people are still accidentally or unsuspectingly buying them with mechanical boot drives in which absolutely cripples performance of the whole workstation. Just put in a cheap default SATA based solid state drive and then let people upgrade it if they want to. That's the way it should be, but it's not. But anyway, if you pick in your storage, Storage is quite cheap at the moment, and it has been for a while. Uh, the best available solid-state drives are called PCIe, that's PCI Express solid-state drives. M.2 is a drive shape, not a actual speed. It's not an indication of how fast it runs. An M.2 drive can be either PCI Express or SATA-based. But I would normally go for an M.2 PCI Express solid-state drive. Size, I can't tell you how big you need your boot drive to be, but I would usually put in a 512 gigabyte C drive, and then I would always put in a secondary mechanical drive as a file dump. That can be just a two terabyte mechanical disk and then people can use it or not if they want to. They're only roughly 70 to $100 at most uh, in a configurator. And then finally, I've mentioned this a couple of times over the course of the class, uh, system age. Just keep an eye on the age of the parts that you're putting in there. A few of the vendors will leave old graphics cards and old CPUs in the configurator for one reason or another. Some clients might insist on architecture from two generations ago, but just be careful not to pick that if you don't 
absolutely need that old hardware. So keep an eye on the age of those components. So based on the components available today, uh, referring back to the HP Z2G4 workstation, I did say that I wanted to tell you why a workstation is the best one. Hopefully we've gone over that and that should be clear by this point why certain things are good for Inventor. But if you were to buy one today, looking at the Xeons, looking at the memory, looking at the graphics cards that are available today, if you were to buy and want to buy the absolute best that money can buy, it's this one here. It's the Intel Xeon E2176G or the E2186G Xeon processor. And that has six cores and 12 threads. The 76G runs at a 3.7 base clock. The 86G runs at a 3.8 gigahertz base clock, but they both turbo up to 4.7. So there's marginal difference between the two of them, and it'd be a marginal price difference between the two of them as well. But in terms of Xeons, both of those will be pretty much identical but pretty much the best one that you can buy. And those two are the same as the i7-8700K uh, in terms of clock frequency, in terms of architecture, and they're the best Xeons that you can buy today for a desk inventor. Anything above those will run at higher core counts with lower frequencies, and that's not even the best bang for the buck. It's just the best that money can buy. It just happens to be quite cheap as well. So in terms of memory, I've put in 32 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC RAM. You can go higher, you can go lower, but you can still get a pretty good workstation with 32 gigabytes of RAM and for a good price. Internal storage, as stated, 512 gig PCI Express solid state drive. And for the graphics card, this is where I've given AMD a bit of love. So I've put in a Quadro P4000 or a P5000. Eventually, the P Pascal architecture will stop being sold and will move to the RTX 4000 or the RTX 5000. And then the AMD Radeon Pro WX5100 or 7100. Those are graphics cards from AMD with enough video RAM to keep you covered. And then this is what it looks like. It's the HP Z2 G4 workstation. This is the one that some of the tests were based off. A lot of the comparisons were based off. And it has the 76G in. And it has 32 gig of RAM, 512 gig storage drive, and the Quadro P2000, uh, which later was replaced with the P5000. And yeah, roughly $2,000 at the time of the presentation. If you want more than the P2000, but to say $2,000 is your budget, you can maybe put in a, a lower storage drive. You can go for 256 gig PCI Express solid state drive and put that extra money towards the larger graphics card, for example. So there's a bit of room to jiggle around with that spec. Uh, in terms of Inventor Bench, uh, remembering on from the scores earlier on, the Lenovo pulled a seven, my home built PC pulled a nine. Most overclocked i7s on the thread, on the forums, where this benchmark tool was first realized and thrown around, uh, most high-end systems pull between 11 and a 12, and the HP pulled a 13, which is phenomenally impressive. It's a very, very, very good score, especially for a workstation with no aftermarket overclocking on it, no you know, exotic cooling system on it. It's just an out-of-the-box relatively good priced workstation and it runs Autodesk Inventor like an absolute dream. There is no workstation, I will put my mortgage on it, that you can buy that will run Autodesk Inventor faster than that. And in terms of a non-workstation build, if you, uh, I did say I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'll just give a quick passing mention to what is today going to be the best home build if you were to build one yourself. You'd be looking at the i9-9900K purely on the strength that it's the fastest clocked core CPU on the market today and it also has eight cores for those times where you do any rendering or any simulation anything like that uh, 5 gigahertz turbo frequency 32 gig of RAM internal drive same as the workstation but the graphics card you would normally not put in a quadro card to a home build because people like to play games and they are very expensive in comparison to the GeForce card so you put in a 1070 or a 1080 Ti or a 2070 or 2080. In terms of a mobile workstation, I took this one to AU Vegas with me. This is the spec of my laptop. It's the Xeon 2176M or a 2186M, six cores, 12 threads. The Roughly the equivalent i7 in the laptops would be the 8850H. Again, same principle applies for mobile workstations as it does for desktops. You want the CPU that runs at the fastest clock speed. That's what it boils down to. 
32 gig of RAM, internal storage, 512 PCI Express solid state drive, and graphics Quadro P3200, 4200, or 5200. The numbering of the mobile Quadros is roughly the same as the numbering of the desktop Quadros. Uh, 3200 is entry level, sort of mid to entry level. P4200 is mid range, 5200 is high range. And uh, if you want to know a bit more about that laptop, I've done a YouTube video on it. Uh, I'll link it in the description, but that's my uh, my video review of that mobile workstation. I'll be doing one on the desktop as well coming soon. And uh, that's pretty much it for the class, mate. So, yeah, quite a lot of inf information to go over there, but that's the best workstation for Autodesk Inventor. That's what you need to look out for. I covered not all the bases. There's some areas that I didn't benchmark test, but that's just purely for time. Across my YouTube channel, I have done a series of 23 benchmark tests that I used on several dozens of workstations and the results consistent. Doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it be creating a shrink wrap, whether it be importing a SOLIDWORKS file into Inventor, whether it be switching from full mode to express mode, whatever it is you're doing in Autodesk Inventor, it's almost entirely uh, bound to the CPU clock speed. So buying the right workstation is, is all about that. Graphics card doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, RAM frequencies, I've tested that. That does not make too much of a difference at all either. It's almost entirely down to your clock speed, mate. That's uh, hopefully what we can get out of this. But I know not everybody will have the budget to be able to buy the workstation that I've shown. That's fine. What you do instead is you take the budget that you've got and then you look for the highest possible clock frequency, base clock and turbo clock, that fits within the build that your budget allows. So that might be an i5, for example, running at the highest clock frequency, or it might be a mid-range Xeon running at the highest clock frequency you could possibly afford. It's just scaling it down, maybe uh, compromising on some other components and then picking a higher CPU perhaps. Uh, so it's something to think about them. Right, I'm gonna knock that on the head there, mate. That's the class, thank you very much. If anyone's watching this who did attend my class uh, and you submitted a, a survey, thank you very much. If you haven't, can you please do that? Because it helps for kind of getting further classes in future years approved if, uh, if you're a high rated speaker. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna knock that on the head. Thank you very much for this. It was quite the long one. Feel free to post this around the forums anywhere you need people to see and stop spreading bad information. Please show them this. This only applies to Autodesk Inventor, but that's kind of the point. You can't do a video like this or a test like this and say it applies to all CAD applications. It's You have to do this for each one. They all have their own individual modules that have different requirements of the computer, so. All right, mate, thank you very much. I'll see you in the next one. Toodle.